but I heard it. Awesome. So now you have to put on your official face <laughs> because recording is in progress. <laughs> you will see it. Not much different. <laughs> right, I wish I could do better. <clears throat> yeah. So okay, we, we, we'll we'll start. No, let's let's uh, just talk. Let's have fun. Yeah, let's ask just me, talk. Ask me what you want to ask. Him. Let's see okay. where it takes. Where it takes yeah, I, I want to greet you no matter what. First, Sam, thank you for being here, taking the time. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, always. Thank, thank you. you Sam. Thank you for referring to my work in your book. Digital Mind of Tomorrow. I, it's on my reading list. Actually, I was tempted. I started to read it. And I'm going to read it on my forthcoming trip to Romania. So this is my reading material then. But thank you all the same for sending me a copy. Thank you so much. You are a big part of it. I can I cannot not sending to you. I'm <laughs> actually very um, excited. I would say also looking forward to talking with you. I'll explain why in the sense um, this book or everything I've been doing uh, lately, it's to observe or we, we talk about it to see the world through, including this book, through the lenses of business, technology, psychology, sociology, and philosophy. And uh, based on my quite a list, quite a list um, there's a reason I kind of put this combination is not randomly and um, based on my observation of you and you are one of the few people or I would even say probably the first person I came across that kind of touched on all of them uh, in a in a decent way not just you know I know about them you are oh, I have it here in case I forgot <laughs> you are a writer you're an author and you are a professor of psychology, and you have a PhD in philosophy and physics. Correct me if I did my wrong research. And you also used to be in business, and you also told me about that yourself, you're in economics, and you know about technology. Plenty of your videos showed me that, and you not just know on the surface, you know deep in roots how it affects the world, meaning yeah. the humans. That's because, so, I, that's because I was Israel's uh, first venture capitalist. So <laughs> when I was much younger, I started the venture capital industry in Israel, which is now second in size to the United States. And I was also a stockbroker. Mm -hmm. so I learned about the nexus, the, the confluence between finance and technology. Right. And um, so my background is, is highly unusual because the first... Um, the first 20 years of my life, I've been in, I've been into physics and, and philosophy, and I finished my doctorate. I was, I'm also a medical doctor, so I finished mm -hmm. medicine. Mm -hmm. But then I gave up on academia, and I went to business. And then within business, I focused on commodity trading. And then from commodity trading, I branched out into finance, and from finance to venture capital and technology. And I'm talking like 50 years ago, 40 years ago. That's when it was not that popular. <laughs> <laughs> and then... The last 25 years, I've, yeah. I've dedicated to psychology. And uh, in between, I was an economist and economic advisor to governments. Now, if you live as long as I have, you will also have nine or 10 careers. <laughs> That's totally normal. Don't be too impressed. It reflects my age. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being so humble. Um, I do know people also work their entire life on one occupation and also people like you i appreciate both of them and uh yeah thank you for sharing and now we know you uh quite a lot based on your professional background this is the question i ask almost all my guests now tell us about you as a person with three words meaning if you have to choose three words to describe yourself what are those words and why you chose them I am fiercely protective of the truth. I'm addicted to the truth. And I will make personal sacrifices. And unfortunately, I will sacrifice other people as well, their emotions, in order to propagate the truth. But I'm not sure that I'm doing it out of a moralistic judgment or a moral cognition. I think possibly there's a little sadism in that. 
is the truth hurts. And I know that the truth hurts because I'm a psychologist. And yet I continue to wield it as a blunt instrument. So I don't think I should be praised for that. <laughs> That's the first. Mm -hmm. the second, second attribute is um, um, fairness and, and justice. I'm very exercised when they are lacking. And the third is the, the surrealistic and supernatural belief in the ability to communicate information, truth, facts to people, despite all evidence to the contrary. And despite everything we know in psychology about cognitive biases and cognitive distortions, which tell us, which tells us that people are not open to uh, confront facts, to modify their opinions, to alter their behavior. People are not malleable. They're not flexible. They're very rigid, extremely rigid. And when the rigidity reaches a certain point, it's called personality disorder. Most people are on the verge of personality disorder. That's why it's very difficult. That's why people say, but everyone around me is a narcissist, which of course is not true. <laughs> everyone around you could be narcissistic, could have a narcissistic style, as Lynn Sperry calls it, narcissistic style. Because people are always on the verge of a personality disorder because they are very inflexible. They are not open. That's, these are my three traits, I think. Interesting. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you for open up oh, for the us. Fourth, the fourth is I like red, dry red dry wine. wine. Red wine. The, red mega, wine. Pie, the mega pine. Yeah. <laughs> That's a mega pine. It's definitely a mega pine. In terms of <laughs> mega, 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 mega pine. <laughs> a mega pine. Thank you. Thank you. So now, ready for the questions? Always. Always. Are you ready for the answers? That's the question. <laughs> Always. <laughs> then we make, a, we make a perfect pair. Yeah. <laughs> so hear me out. So what's your understanding of the following terms, following words, and what is your understanding of the relationship among them? These are the words. Heart, mind, brain, intelligence, and consciousness. Five. Sorry if it's too long. I want to hear out your understanding of them and what do you consider the relationship among them? Intelligence is the capacity to observe connections between mm -hmm. ostensibly separate and disparate phenomena and objects. Mm -hmm. So it's what we call synoptic view. Intelligence is the ability to have a synoptic view. This this connect this ability to connect generates insights and insights allow you to reframe reality in a way that yields new information which you can then leverage to obtain favorable outcomes from the environment in other words intelligence renders you more self-efficacious but what people fail to understand mm -hmm. is that intelligence is like electrical energy it's a resource so mm -hmm. it's electricity, it's mm -hmm. a utility. Mm -hmm. It can be used by the positive aspects of your personality, mm -hmm. or it can be abused by the negative aspects of your personality. It's neutral, it's value neutral. Not so the heart, what you call the heart. The heart is, of course, a pump, a very simple pump. And, mm -hmm. uh, that's not what you meant, I assume. <laughs> but the heart the seat of emotions or the proverbial seat of emotions, the metaphorical seat of emotions mm -hmm. is not value neutral. It does reflect underlying beliefs, values, mores, social and cultural uh, impositions like socialization, acculturation. It reflects personal history and so on. So it's a much more, much more varied thing than intelligence. The emphasis starting in the First World War, the emphasis mm -hmm. on analytical intelligence, as represented mm -hmm. by IQ, mm -hmm. reduced is a part of a general trend of reductionism in psychology, which culminated with behaviorism in the, in the 1960s. 
mm -hmm. where people were considered no different to rats in a laboratory and still are to a large extent because we presume to we presume to conduct experiments on mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. when actually you cannot conduct experiments on people because they are the type of subject matter who is affected by the experiment and also who changes from one day to the next. Consequently, we can replicate fewer than 10% of psychological experiments, which means there is a replication or replicability crisis in psychology. The heart is the core. It's very complex and it's intimately connected to cognitions. Nowadays, we consider emotions to be a type of cognition. When cognition is coupled with sensor, with sensory input, that's what we call emotion. Emotion is reactive, exactly like many cognitions. It's a subspecies of cognition. So the mind and the heart are two sides, two flip sides of the same coin, not as we used to think. There are two flip sides of the same coin. We know, for example, that if we have a thought, it mm -hmm. can induce an emotion. Mm -hmm. And if we have an emotion, it often causes us to think in certain ways. Mm -hmm. are intimately connected. So that's mm -hmm. the mind, the heart, intelligence. The brain is a very difficult issue. <laughs> yes, it seems to be the simplest. But actually, it is very controversial. You see, we have this presupposition. Mm -hmm that the brain is the seat of identity and the seat of the mind. This is highly contentious, both in psychology and in medicine and physiology. I'll give you one example. Mm -hmm. Most of the hormones that regulate mood are not produced in the brain. They're produced in the intestines. Serotonin, for example, is produced 91% in the intestines, not mm -hmm. in the brain. Another example is that the connection between the brain and the spine is not clear. We know, for example, that spinal fluid at night when you sleep mm -hmm. cruises through the brain and cleanses it, cleans it. It's like a cleaning crew in a, in a high rise, you know, at night. And yet we don't know why does this fluid come from the spine? And where does it go afterwards? Or what does it do afterwards with the allegedly the dirt? <laughs> <laughs> we also have no idea about most functions of the brain. We have no idea what is sleep, what is dreaming. We don't we know very little about the brain, and what we, yet with hubris, <laughs> the yes. glorious hubris, we claim that we know everything there is, or almost everything there is to know, and we even administer drugs or medications that affect this very sensitive organ without knowing what the hell we're doing. It's a very dangerous game. Now, on the philosophical level, correlation is not causation. We can establish correlations between mental events and physiological events, biochemical events, electrobiochemical events. We can establish this connection. And this connection is very regular, like the rising of the sun in the morning. But we have no idea if the mental events cause the physiological events or vice versa. They are correlated, but we have no idea about the causation. For example, the brains of psychopaths are very different to the brains of normal people in terms of gray matter, white matter, the striatus, the amygdala, most regions of the brain are very different and the functioning of the brain is very different. Yet, was this caused by the emergence of psychopathy in early childhood? Because psychopathy starts in early childhood. Mm -hmm. Was this caused because the brain is forming and sh being shaped in early childhood? Was right. the psychopathy the cause of these, these malfunctions or abnormalities? Or was the abnormality already present at birth? We don't have an answer to this. We don't know what causes what. And so I would be very careful about the brain, extremely careful. I am of the mind, and mind you, this is only speculation. Mm -hmm. I'm of the mind that the distinction between the brain 
and the rest of the body mm -hmm. is both artificial and counterfactual. I think if evolution and nature act in rational ways, if mm -hmm. they adhere to scientific reasoning, so to speak, <laughs> processing would be distributed, not centered in one organ. I think most of our mental functions are distributed throughout the body. And I think the focus on the brain as the exclusive seat of mental life, including cognition, emotion, analysis, you name it, mm -hmm. has led us astray because we had neglected the rest of the body. I fully believe that there is what used to be called distributed parallel processing. In other words, what we call today connectionism. I believe the whole human body right. is one giant laboratory of mental life. Now, we know it's partly true because, for example, when we amputate people, mm -hmm. there is phantom limb, phantom limb syndrome, where the, the person continues to feel the missing limb long after the missing limb is gone. It seems that there is some kind of processing going on on the local level. <laughs> we know that the, the gastrointestinal system has a mind of its own. In essence, a second brain. We know that many areas of the body are not connected to the brain. And yet, they continue to function perfectly. We know there's a lot of information mm. that doesn't reach the brain at all. Mm -hmm. Parts of the body, big parts of the body. Mm -hmm. And finally, we know that the brain consciously registers less than 5% of the information it receives. Less than 5%. And what, right. the, brain, what the brain does, it generates on the fly models, simulations of reality. When you're listening to me, when you're looking at me, luckily for you, you observe only or absorb only 5%. What, you, what you're doing yeah. You, you, you create in your mind an image and a simulation of Sam Vakni. Mm -hmm. And when you're listening to me, because you listen only to 5% of what I'm saying, you're filling in the blanks. There's a, a series of heuristic extra, 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 extrapolations in the brain, mm -hmm. mathematical models. Everything is happening in your mind, not outside. And I refuse to believe that all this is taking place only in your brain, because if we were to meet face to face, mm -hmm. I would have an impact on multiple organs of you, not only on your brain, even if I don't touch you. For example, I would immediately exchange with you a molecule which contains 100 items of information about my genetic and immune system. And that is totally unconscious, non-deliberative. So, vice versa, I will also send you uh, my molecules from my body to yours. Is it is this an interactive process from yes, both? You're sending me a molecule. I'm sending you a molecule. Whenever people meet, they exchange this molecule. All people, in all settings. But you see, people affect each other at a distance. For example. The some fields of the brain extend up to 100 meters. Mm -hmm. uh, another example when a woman passes next to a man, mm -hmm. and by the way, doesn't matter how she looks and doesn't matter how old she is, shockingly, <laughs> when any woman passes next to any man, regardless of age, looks, or whatever, mm -hmm. the level of testosterone production in the men increases by 40 percent. Four zero. She just has to pass, not to talk, not to look not to interact in any way, just to pass. We are regulated by our environment all the time. In certain personality disorders, the regulation extends even to the most basic and minimal functions, mm -hmm. like reality, perception of reality, a sense of self-worth. And then we say that these people are disordered because their, their external regulation is too much. But what we don't realize, Yes. They are 99% regulated by the environment. That's why I am utterly against the counterfactual concepts of self, mm -hmm. individual, mm -hmm. personality, 
Mm -hmm. I think these are nonsensical concepts that came from Germany and Austria mm -hmm. in, at the end of the 19th century, when these were authoritarian societies with a unitary structure of government and a unitary structure in the family. So they established a hierarchy in psychology. The psychology that we are studying today, and that we are teaching today, is a 19th century German authoritarian thinking. And so there is a self. And the self is like the pater familias, is the father of family, is like the Kaiser, you know, is like the hero, <laughs> the self. Yeah. He is the leader, he is the it's a German thing. Yes. It simply reflects cultural mores and perceptions and a civilization that's no longer with us. Today we live in a network society, a distributed society. Mm -hmm. We must rewrite. I I'm proposing to rewrite psychology from scratch, getting rid of antiquated concepts like self and individual, mm -hmm. and replacing them mm -hmm. with self-assembling networks of self-states. Mm -hmm. Much more fluid um, approach. So we have to rewrite. Does that mean human changed or, or the previous understanding was limited? How to approach everything, this? Everything we do in science, mm -hmm. well known that everything we do in science is uh, affected by our culture, cultural context, our society, beliefs, mm -hmm. we, be, beliefs and values we hold. Mm -hmm. The people who created psychology were Germans. Mm -hmm. Wundt, Wund, Freud, or mm -hmm. Austria. Mm -hmm. German sphere. This was, these were authoritarian societies with a unitary center of control, Mm -hmm. with rigid hierarchical social structures so they created a description so the they mind that, that looked the same it was so different. it was a limited version of psychology it's a limited it's version a culture what we call culture bound it's a culture dependent version mm -hmm. of psychology and by rewriting what do you mean we need to fit into the mass humanity not just based on one culture we know that people are not unitary, they mm -hmm. are not fixed, mm -hmm. they flow. People, yeah. um, a human being is a river, yeah. not, a, not a lake, not a pond, it's a river. Mm -hmm. It's like Heraclitus said, Pantare, everything, everything flows. You can't enter the same river twice. There's no such thing as self at any, at any moment in reaction to other people, in reaction to environmental cues. Mm -hmm. We tend to become different people. You're not the so same what, at, at work. What's the role of psychology? If I may ask, what's the role of psychology? What's Sounds the like there's no pattern. There's no way to trace. We no, constantly no, 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 evolve. Make an inventory. You can make an inventory of your self states. If I were to observe you long enough, to your detriment, <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I would be I would be able to map out, to com compile an inventory of your self states. Uh, uh, so I would know that you have, I don't know, eight or nine self states, mm -hmm. and that when you are subject to humiliation, rejection, and abandonment, your self state is psychopathic, which is the case, which is the case in borderline personality disorder. No. <laughs> they become secondary psychopaths when they are rejected, abandoned, and humiliated. So mm -hmm. it's possible to to make a map of you, a map. Got but, it. But to say that you are one. In mm -hmm. all conditions, in mm -hmm. all environments, mm -hmm. in all people, all the time, mm -hmm. and you will remain this way to the end of your days. Yeah. That is rank nonsense. It flies in the face of everything we know about human beings. But we don't dare. We don't dare confront this lie at the core of psychology. Still? First of all, yes. First Still? Of all, mm -hmm. Many people make a lot of money from this. Okay. Yes. They are best, huge it's vested interest. industry. The capitalism. Coaches, yeah. mm -hmm. Coaches, psychologists, therapists, everyone makes a lot of money. It's an industry. Before I forgot, what do you what's your understanding of consciousness? Anything. Just there your are some, there are some problems mm -hmm. that are unresolvable, that will never have a have an answer in principle. Never mind how much you know, never mind how much you work. About no consciousness. Same. Consciousness is like God. These are concepts 
that are meaningless in the sense that you cannot assign meaning to them. For example, you cannot say true or false. Mm -hmm. They are meaningless. Consciousness, I dare you and defy you to define consciousness. God, there is no procedure I can think of that can determine if God exists or not. Similarly, there's no procedure I can think of that can help us define consciousness. We don't, not only we don't know what it is, but mm -hmm. we can never in principle know what it is. Mm -hmm. The reason is that we are both the raw material, the subject and the object. We are both observers. Right. We, we, we are observing us. This creates effectively an infinite regression because you're observing who? Mm -hmm. You're observing the observer. And the observer is observing you, observing the observer. And there's no end to this. This is the cycle, never ending. Mm -hmm. Infinite regression. There's no, there's no end to this. Mm -hmm. When you try to define consciousness, you engage in a process called introspection. You yes. Look, you look inside. You look. You observe yourself. Right. But some someone must make this. Someone must do this observation. Who is doing it? Who's well, the one? <laughs> who's the one who is observing? Well, another consciousness. Only a conscious entity can observe. So if you're observing your own consciousness, there must be a meta-consciousness, another consciousness, observing this consciousness. And of course, it's infinite. <laughs> there's no yeah, infinite. that's the rapid hole, right? It never ends. There's no, yes, there's no way to define consciousness. Now, we do know, of course, mm -hmm that we feel something. For example, we feel that we exist. Right. But even that is even that is contestable. For example, how do I know that you're human? How do I know that when you tell me that you're feeling sad, you are feeling sad? And how do I know that what you define as sadness is my sadness? Mm -hmm. In other words, we have a problem to access other people's minds. We have to rely on self-reporting. Other people report, and we have to rely on the veracity and the accuracy of these reports, which mm -hmm. is extremely bad science. <laughs> <laughs> so the only mind we know for sure we have access to yeah. is ours. We have no access to any other mind, and therefore we cannot know anything about any other mind, period. The assumption that you and I have anything whatsoever in common mm -hmm. is fallacious. End of story. Because you can't prove it. And you can't falsify it. It's not subject to scientific, to the scientific method. Prove scientific. Can I ask what's your understanding of science and what's your understanding of spirituality? And how do you consider the relationship between the two? How do you define them? Science is a method. Yeah. To a method to establish a possible way to get closer to the truth without ever attaining it. Without it's, ever attaining it. Without uh -huh. ever attaining it. Uh -huh. It's a method of organizing observations in a way that will yield predictions that we can then falsify. Right. If these predictions cannot be falsified, it's not science. Science, therefore, relies crucially on the ability to be wrong. Science is not about being right. It's about being wrong. That's not me. That's Karl Popper. So science creates theories, and then all the scientists, once there's a new theory, all the scientists are trying to destroy it, trying to prove it wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, scientists have been trying to prove Einstein wrong for 100 years now. Everyone is trying to prove Einstein. People were trying to prove Einstein wrong within a few years from the publication of relativity theory. They were measuring light around the sun. You know, mm -hmm. they were trying to prove him wrong. This mm -hmm. is what science is about. Proving, proving theory is wrong. The to belief, get closer to the truth. <laughs> the belief is, is, exactly, the belief is that as we eliminate what is wrong, exactly like Sherlock Holmes said, 
Sherlock Holmes said, if you eliminate what is improbable, whatever remains, however, un however unlikely, must be the truth. So science is the same. Science is eliminated. And, and then by process of elimination, it, science believes that it's getting closer to the truth. But science is a religion. It's a belief system. Science believes in the scientific method. Science believes in falsifiability. Science believes that believe, scientists believe that observations have value and are somehow connected to reality and not, for example, to the human mind. Because I can construct a case easily that everything we see is not real, but a simulation. Is mm -hmm. David Chalmers, the famous philosopher, even yeah. thinks this is the case. <laughs> so, but there's a series of beliefs that underlie science, and in this sense, it's a religion. It's a faith-based system. Spirituality is the kind of thing that I avoid because it's indefinable, exactly like consciousness and God. I don't think anyone agrees on what is spiritual. Any two people agree on what is spirituality. I think spirituality is the feeling of transcendence, the feeling that there is something beyond you and beyond the world, which you cannot be captured with reason. So spirituality is anything that mm -hmm. cannot be captured with reason, but with, for example, belief, faith, mm -hmm. a faith in God, for example, or, and so and we so have they... two competing systems. Yeah. One system uses reason. Yes. To get closer to an alleged ostensible truth, which maybe doesn't exist at all. The very concept of truth is very contentious. Mm -hmm. And the other system is based on a leap of faith, as Kierkegaard called it. Is 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 based on the belief, the belief that you can glean knowledge, even if it's only your knowledge, idiosyncratic, cannot be communicated. For example, in a mystical in a mystical experience, yes? you can glean knowledge, not using reason, using other means, many other means, even mushrooms. But you can glean knowledge, not using reason. So these are two. These two are in competition, and yes, they are mutually exclusive. Anyone who tells you that religion and science are compatible or that is, has no idea what is religion has no idea what is science. Science is not compatible with religion because it's the religion of reason. And all other, all other doctrines and ways of thought and schools, they are not based on reason while science is. Additionally, science uses a language, a highly specific language called mathematics. Mm -hmm. But mathematics can be used and abused in spiritual disciplines. For example, in astrology, there's a lot of mathematics. So that's, not, that's not a distinguishing feature. So there's no way these two can be compatible or merged in whatsoever no. sense. Never, ever. Anyone who claims otherwise has no idea what he's talking about. And I heard, I heard a very interesting thing. I heard that uh, mathematics uh, people, they, they have the highest chance to get a, a mental disorder. Is that true? I'm not aware of this correlation. I may have missed some studies, but I'm not aware of this correlation. Although there were very famous mathematicians like Nash, mm -hmm. who was a schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. But there were mentally ill people in many other disciplines. So I'm not sure there's a necessary connection. Mathematics, <laughs> mathematics is a language. Mm -hmm. It's the rudiments of language. It's a language reduced to its base elements. Mm -hmm. It is extremely surprising, for example, why mathematics describes reality so efficiently. Mm -hmm. We have no idea. No mm -hmm. one can give you an answer to this. Mm -hmm. But it's a core core problem in philosophy and in, in, uh, in, for example, physics. Yeah. Why is mathematics so efficient? We don't know. Why is logic so efficient? And logic is the, is the, is the forerunner of arithmetic. And so why these languages, let's call them formal languages. Mm -hmm. Why formal languages are so efficient when the world is not formal? The world right. is fuzzy. The world right. is fuzzy. The world is crazy. The world is chaotic. Yeah. The world blends and moves. The world is more like smoke. And yet, 
a highly rigid formal <laughs> set of languages captures the world perfectly. How is this possible? We don't know the answer. And it's a huge, huge argument in, in philosophy and, and, yeah. and science. Yeah, this underlying code that seems running running this chaotic world. Um, so Carl Gustav John said in his 1959 interview, and he said, the only real danger that exists is man himself, and we are pitifully unknown of it. We know nothing of man, far too little. That's from 1959. Now, do you agree with him? Or anything changed for better or for worse? Nothing much changed, no. As far as the quiddity, the essence of what it is to be a human, what is, what is the human experience? Mm -hmm. I don't think much has changed for the very simple reason that I mentioned earlier. You cannot mm -hmm. really communicate it. No one has access to another mind. And many, many experiences are so idiosyncratic, so individual, that you cannot communicate these experiences. For example, if right now, because you're exposed to me, you will have a mystical experience. <laughs> mm -hmm. You will not be able to communicate it to me. Never mind mm -hmm. how many words you will use. Mm -hmm. So this will remain forever trapped in your mind. Never get out. So... The essence of, of what it is to be a human is still remains a mystery and will remain a mystery forever because of this barrier in communication. We have a concept in philosophy called intersubjectivity. It is the belief that people somehow, based on similarities and based on a contract, an agreement, can somehow develop empathy for each other. Mm -hmm. And intersubjectivity is highly dubious, highly dubious. <laughs> to use the British understatement. So I don't think, I think each one of us is, a, is solipsistic, is an island. Yeah. And I don't think there are any bridges between these islands and no cruise ships going between these islands. We're mm -hmm. totally islands. Mm -hmm. We are, however, as islands do, we are mm -hmm. embedded in an ocean. Mm -hmm. And the ocean is this collective, what can, we can call mankind or humanity, there are dynamics which characterize masses of people. Many of these dynamics are negative. For example, the Nazi party or Trump supporters in, on January 6th. So many collective dynamics are very negative, mob, mob dynamics, mm -hmm. crowd dynamics. But many of these dynamics are conducive to survival mm -hmm. and they do elevate us beyond the confines and the limits of a single human body. So this is the ocean in which all the islands are embedded. Jung tried to cope with it. He, he called it collective unconscious. Yes. Don't ask. Jung by, the way, <laughs> Jung, by the way, suffered for five years from psychosis. He was hospitalized. He was a mentally mm -hmm. ill, very mentally ill person. Mm -hmm. So he came up with all kinds of UFOs and <laughs> he was mm -hmm. a conspiracy theorist. Don't ask. But he had a few insights, a few great insights, of course, uh, yeah. mixed with a lot of trash. So one of his insights was the insights of archetypes. Another insight was the insight of collective unconscious. What he was trying to say is that we all share a commonality yeah. which transcends, transcends our individual mm -hmm. mind. Mm -hmm. And we operate within this lattice, within this network, yeah. sometimes unawares. And it is this network, probably, that determines us to a very large extent. Now, in the 1960s, there was a school called Object Relations School. Mm -hmm. And they said that there's no such thing as self. But what happens is we are the assembly or the assemblage or the, or the compendium of our relationship with others. So we are the end result the culmination of our relationships with everyone in our lives. Mm -hmm. so it's called, that's why they call it object relations, like mm -hmm. relations with, now, by the way, in psychology, the word object means another person. <laughs> it just shows, <laughs> you, just shows you what psychologists are made of. 
Psychopaths, all of them. Especially the of psychology. So, the kingdom of psychopaths. Yes. Okay. So I, in answer to, in a, in, a very, in a very long answer to your question, I believe that we should, to, to find meaning, and significance and direction and all these things, we should not look to the human body or human mind, but we should look, we should look to collective dynamics. I think it's another mistake in Western psychology, psychology mm -hmm. in the West. Mm -hmm. Again, you see the influence of culture and society. Yeah. Western societies are individualistic. Yes. So the psychology is the psychology of the individual. Yes. When actually I believe that 90%, if not more, of the relevant dynamics mm -hmm. are not individual at all. They're social. They're it's collective. a holistic. Yeah. Holistic. Yes. But you see again the effect of culture and society on, on so called science. That's why I don't think psychology is a science, it's a pseudoscience. So you approve science, but you don't approve the psychology. In the science system. I'm stuff. a physicist. I'm a mm -hmm. physicist. Mm -hmm. There's a new a new theory that I developed in physics that is now you know, becoming mainstream, and I I hope would be of interest to people. What is that? It's a theory. It's it's the equivalent of uh, it's like relativity theory, but on different premises. So it's a it's a global theory. It's a theory of everything. Um, we can go into it later if you want. Okay. But, but I'm like, I have multiple personality. I have half of my mind, which is a physicist. So yeah. I'm, used, I'm used to rigorous exact science and to the scientific method and so on. Yeah. And then I'm teaching psychology. And psychology is not a science. Psychology, psychology is, is not a science. Pseudo, no, it's a pseudoscience. It's a, it's a form of literature. It's, it's a belief. It's a religion. I would call it literature. It's, literature. It's descriptive. The greatest psychology to have ever lived, psychologist, is uh, Dostoevsky. No one exceeds Dostoevsky. Not Freud, not anyone. Not, not the, the modern, you know. But psychologists want money, like everyone. And they want to be respected, like everyone. So they pretend to be scientists. Because when you pretend to be a scientist, you get a lot of grant money. And you can also make a lot of money because you're an authority, so you can charge people money for treatment, for this, for that. Also, you get to wear lab coats, you know, white <laughs> lab coats, and you look a lot like a medical doctor. So it, it's good for the ego. And so modern psychologists, when you go to universities, Ivy League universities and so on, mm -hmm. you go to labs, psychology labs, and they look like medical labs. But what are they studying there? It's nonsense. Experimental psychology is unmitigated trash and nonsense there's nothing you can learn from it and none of the experiments almost is replicable it's total blooded it's i can't be it's a scam simply a scam these are con artists and i have to be blunt note it note it we have this recording people will hear about it i hope they can be aware whether they agree or not just to be aware, you mentioned in your one of the latest video, dystopia, I'm sorry, dystopian, dystopian. We're so lost that ever because we enter into a uncharted territory. We're so lost. And I, I said the exactly same thing in the book, by the way, again, not to promote my book, but I just want to say the resonation. And uh, there are all types of issues. There's all types of challenges. And we seem to try to deal with them. And among them, I want to particularly mention the depression rate you mentioned. The mental issue has skyrocketed. Wildest material life, we're being in the best situation ever. The wealth, all this omnipresent technology. If you have to find out what are the costs, the root costs, not the laws, the regulation, we need to build another building or a rocket. I guess that's part of the psychology as well, because all this is by human. What are the causes? 
periods of uh, transition mm -hmm. in human history are common. There's nothing special about our transition because we're in a period of transition, of course. There's nothing special about our transition by virtue of the fact that it's a transition. Transitions are normal. Mm -hmm. There are, however, two distinguishing features that had never, ever before happened mm -hmm. in human history. Mm -hmm. Never. Number one, we are experiencing transition in every field of life. Mm -hmm. You had periods before where there was a transition in gender relations, for example. There were periods like this. Transitions from matriarchy to patriarchy mm -hmm. happened a few times mm -hmm. in human history. Mm -hmm. Or vice versa. You, for example, in North Africa, there was transition from patriarchy to matriarchy. Mm -hmm. So this transition happened. You had periods where people transitioned from villages and farms to cities. Urbanization it was a very traumatic transition, mega transition. You had periods where, where people adopted new technologies, mm -hmm. which were destructive technologies and altered their ways of life in fundamental, in fundamental uh, ways. And this also happened a lot. Yeah even in the Middle Ages. We think the Middle Ages were stagnant and so on. Actually, Middle Ages were a ferment, a hotbed of technological innovation. Of course, the 19th century, industrial revolution and so on. We had all this. Never mm -hmm. in, we had political transitions. Mm -hmm. In the 18th century, we began to transition from monarchies and empires to democracies, the mm -hmm. French Revolution, the French mm -hmm. Revolution, the revolutions of 1848. So each, each transition, we had before, mm -hmm. never in human history. We had all the transitions at once, which is what we're having today. We have all the transitions, all of them at once, gender transitions, political transitions, technological transitions, you name it, we are transitioning. We are not prepared for this. It's too much change. Alvin Toffler predicted this in his yeah. books. In his mm -hmm. book, books, The Future Shock, and so on. This is the first distinguishing feature. Yeah. And there is a much, much more pernicious distinguishing feature today that mm -hmm. never happened before in human history. Mm -hmm. In previous periods right. of transition, mm -hmm. some institutions were affected and destroyed or replaced Right. Most institutions stayed intact. They remained functioning. Mm -hmm. So in the 14th century, when you had the Black Death in Europe and yes. everything was falling apart, the family remained intact. The church was there. Your feudal lord still remained in the, on the land. The monarchy prevailed. In other words, even though you were experiencing as an individual, you were experiencing turmoil, revolution, right. and transition. Right. The institutions around you, your community, your church, your feudal system, the monarchy, everything around you was stable. There was stability. Mm -hmm. The transition was limited to some institutions and some aspects. Mm -hmm. But 90% of institutions and dimensions of existence remained fixed and stable. Inflation was close to zero for 300 years in Europe. Mm -hmm. so everything, even prices were stable. Imagine mm -hmm. that the price of bread in the, in the 16th century mm -hmm. was the same mm -hmm. like in the 18th century. Okay. Imagine. So, and this now, is the first time in human history that all our institutions, without a single exception, have collapsed. We don't have families. Mm -hmm. We don't have friends. In 1980, a typical person, according to studies, mm -hmm. had 10 friends. Today, the number is one. We don't have families. We don't have friends. We don't have marriages. We don't have the church. We don't have the state. We don't trust experts. We don't believe the authorities. We don't. 
There's no nothing. There's no island of stability. There are no institutions. You are on your own, totally. You're experiencing as an individual the greatest by far moment of transition in human history mm -hmm. with multiple transitions in everything. Your mm -hmm. gender relations, your marriage, your, I mean, you name it, you're transitioning. Technology, you run your own, talk, you plan your own transformation. Mm -hmm. Pandemics, wars, you name it. Mm -hmm. And yet you're all alone because no institution around you is functioning and the institutions that are still there, you don't trust them. Including mm -hmm. this is all the first. authorities. Yes, including all the authorities and experts. And this is the first time in human history. These two things are the first time in human history. Multiple transitions, I would say all pervasive, ubiquitous transitions, and no supportive institutions. So you are utterly on your own, atomized, isolated, alienated, totally on your own. Mm -hmm. So people resort to fantasy because they can't tolerate reality. They can't bear reality anymore. So they retreat to fantasy. Mm -hmm. And they create technologies that mm. encourage fantasy. Soon to come, the metaverse, which is the <laughs> ultimate form of fantasy. You know. Yes. They retreat. They're running away. They, they don't want to live in reality anymore. Reality is too much. Too brutal. No. Too, too unpredictable. People don't okay. tolerate. People have low tolerance for uncertainty. The uncertainty now is maximal because yes. even institutions are not there anymore. They can uh, keep up with all these changes. Too much. Powerless. They cannot keep up and they cannot look, look up to role models, experts, authorities, institutions, God, church, family, community. I mean, someone, friends, something. They can't. There's nobody there. You're all alone. You're floating in a bubble. That's it. You're, you're on your own. If bad things happen to you, they happen to you alone. You know? So, of course, people have, uh, you know, online forums and this, that. It's simulation. It's nonsense. It's not real. We know, for example, that face-to-face -face communication, pressing the flesh, skins touching, <laughs> infinitely, is infinitely better impacts than any any forum online yes so you kind of answered my next question already i was gonna ask you the role I of have this a tendency to do this it's not nice of me <laughs> i'm not a nice person yeah. you have the foresight to answer my question in advance you know what i'm gonna ask the omnipresent technology what's the role and you definitely answered me already i would say just complete the sentence is I would say that um, depression and anxiety yeah are reactions to this world and the compensation is technology technology had become compensatory this is another transition I can enumerate right now I can make a list yeah 50 50 major transitions that each and every human being is undergoing right now we cannot avoid this transition they're all over on a typical period in history, you had two or three transitions. Now there's 50 that I can think of. And if I think very hard, probably 100. One of these transitions is the role of technology. Mm -hmm. The main role of technology in human history until the 1990s. So that's a very long period. We are talking technology. Technology started about 30 or 40,000 years ago when you took um, a flint when you took a stone and you made it into a knife you know so tool tool making tool making tool started making. 40 to 50 thousand years ago mm -hmm. so technology is old until 1990 the main role of technology was to extend your body mm -hmm. so if you had a knife it extended your hand if you were riding yes. a car it extended your legs yes if you're reading a book, it extended your mind. I mean, it was all about extending the body. In 1990, there was a massive shift. Technology was no longer about extending the body. It was about escaping reality. It's a massive shift. May I, may, may I jump in a little question? What's the sh trigger for this shift? 
Why reality upset? Became, reality became unbearable. Unbearable, unbearable since 1990s. It started before. It took, it took time. Took time for technologies to evolve. But I would say that around the 1970s, mm -hmm. 1970s, life yeah. be began to become unbearable. Already. In the, in the United States, you had the Watergate scandal, and, you know, uh, collapse of the trust in authorities, in the media, in universities, and so on. Then the family collapsed, starting in the 1960s and 70s, the divorce rate went up to 50%. Then promiscuity, um, not agentic promiscuity, but promiscuity is a, a measure of desperation, um, made it very difficult to form relationships and couples destroyed intimacy skills. So relationships deteriorated. And today, for example, the rate of marriage is 50% less than it was, 50 percent less than in 1990. And the, the people are not compensating for this by, for example, cohabiting. So the <laughs> general number of relationships is much down. Of course, childbearing, everything is totally collapsed. So in the 1970s, an existential crisis started. It took 20 years for technology to catch up, but you had, you had the the initial harbingers of technology. For example, you had dating apps in the 1970s. Already. <laughs> Already. Already. Yeah. So computers, of course, 1980, you had Apple, 2C. You had the first Apples. Uh, before yes. that, you had Commodores and Ataris. And so you had, you had harbingers. You could see it coming. You could mm -hmm. see it coming. The mm -hmm. internet effectively went, went public in 1990, more or less. Mm -hmm. So it was all about escaping reality. Technology stopped no longer was concerned about extending our capacities and our bodies, mm -hmm. but became much more concerned about allowing us to escape reality. That's the fundament of the purpose of technology. That's the Today, product. Yes. Mm -hmm. Today, yes. I would say if you look at technology, first of all, innovation stopped completely. Innov I know it sounds bizarre, but innovation actually stopped in more or less the 1960s. I know it, for example, from, from uh, physics. Yeah. Nothing really new since 1980. I know it from psychology. Nothing yeah. really new since 1990. I know it from other fields. Nothing really new has happened in the past few decades. Even if you look at this, that's almost the latest Apple. Yeah. All the technologies. Yeah. All the technologies mm -hmm. in this thing mm -hmm. of the 1960s, 50s, and 40s. All the core, the core technology. All the technologies. Chip all the technology. GPS. All there's not one technology in this in this iPhone yeah. that was invented after 1960. <laughs> not one. Mm. We are repackaging. All we are doing is repackaging, and this gives the illusion of innovation. Yes. Yes. Even in medicine, I would say, innovation stopped in the 1980s. mRNA vac vaccines, mm -hmm. everyone says they were just invented. They were not just invented. They started 20 years ago. So innovation is dying all over. You cannot innovate if you're not in reality. And most people are no longer in reality. What is the reality? Reality sucks. Big time. Reality are these transitions. Reality is the lack of institutions. Reality is, is the disintegration of, of everything you can rely on and everything you've ever believed. Re reality is terrifying, absolutely terrifying. I don't blame people for mm -hmm. running away from it, dissociating. Mm -hmm. You know, ent ent entertainment is a big, a big thing precisely because of this. What do you see out of this 50 or 50,000 transitions? What do you could see? I will say now. What do you could well, see? Not fifty thousand, but fifty. But <laughs> you see, the reason I'm pessimistic is because the transitions of the past were very clear. They were like from less to more. For example, less freedom to more freedom. They led somewhere. They were what I call directional transitions. They, yeah. they had a vision. They had a vision. Now, not all transitions were good. 
For example, yeah. the transition to communism, very bad idea. The transition to Nazism and fascism, not all transitions were good, but all transitions were clear. It was very clear where they're going. Yeah, you could the see the path. Today, transitions mm -hmm. today are fuzzy. They're not clear. For example, I will ask you, where is the relationship between men and women going? <laughs> it's not clear. If you go to Where Afghanistan, if you go to Afghanistan, mm -hmm. it's very clear. In <laughs> Afghanistan, there's a transition. It's a bad, evil, vile transition, but it's clear. It's clear. Yeah, you Women can see. Are becoming you can see where it's going. So we don't mm -hmm. have this vision. We don't have this clarity. And the transitions are fuzzy. They're, they're all over the place. They're leading nowhere. It's a bloody mess. And people disagree on the transition because when you when there was a transition to communism or to Nazism, or to fascism, or even to feminism. Mm -hmm. There was a broad disagree, a broad agreement. It reflected a broad agreement. For example, first wave feminism and second wave feminism. You, many men agreed with it. Many men supported it. Mm -hmm. There was a consensus between men and women, mm -hmm. which is why women obtained rights and so on, because men supported it. But when you go to third wave feminism and fourth wave feminism, which are today, there is no consensus. There's a war. Men don't yeah. agree. Men are fighting back. Women become more and more militant and angry and violent. So the transitions deteriorated because they had no, no consensus. Agreement. They're non-consensual transitions. They are power plays. We are talking about power. Who has mm -hmm. more power? Mm -hmm. That's a very bad state of things. Because humanity crucially relies on cooperation. We are a cooperative species. And cooperation relies on being able to somehow obtain a consensus. Yes. If we fail in this, we will disintegrate as a species. Now we think very, we are very arrogant species. We think <laughs> we are here forever. Let me tell you, no species was more successful than the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs occupied every ecosystem under the sea, over the sea, in land, on trees, you name it. Mm -hmm. Dinosaurs were in the air, they were on the, on the savanna, they were mm -hmm. in jungles, they were on rocks. They were mm -hmm. Dinosaurs ruled the earth in the truest sense. They mm -hmm. occupied every ecosystem. There mm -hmm. were big dinosaurs and small dinosaurs with wings, without, with uh, scales, I mean, you name it. Mm -hmm. And they're no longer with us, are they? So mm -hmm. humans shouldn't think that they are here forever and never mind what happens. You know. And hum human evolution is no longer through the genes. It's through culture. Culture is, is the new human evolution. And if we cannot reach a consensus, this is a good definition of mutation. A mutation in genetic evolution mm -hmm. is when there is a change, usually in a gene, in a gene mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be, but usually in a gene, a change that doesn't sit well with the rest. Mm -hmm. so, so this creates a conflict inside the organism. Right. We are in this situation now. We have developed a series of mutations, cultural mutations, and we can't get over it. If we don't settle these internal disputes and reach some consensus, mm -hmm. we're doomed. We are doomed as a dinosaur. <laughs> Absolutely. We're doomed. Is there any clue about how to settle this doomed situation? Any clue? The first thing is to realize that we are at a serious peril, peril of extinction. <laughs> and I'm not talking about climate change. Mm -hmm. I, for one, for one, doesn't think that climate change really threatens us. I think what it means is that we will have to rebuild many cities and we will have to adapt. We'll have to adapt. We'll have to invent new technologies, of course. That will be a huge transition. It's very, but I don't think it threatens our existence. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it becomes warmer and hotter and there are extreme weather events. We'll survive. This will threaten survive. us. <laughs> but we will not survive. Mm -hmm. Conflicts and transitions, which are 
fundamental to who we are, to our identity, and which we cannot settle, settle consensually. For example, between men and women. The, the conflict, the, the irritability, the, the friction between men and women mm -hmm. is not allowing men and women to have relationships. And so yeah. when they don't have relationships, they don't have children. This is a real threat. It's immediate threat. And so- Can you rephrase that again? The real threat. What's the real threat in one sentence? The real threat is that if we don't reach a consensus on multiple, on where our mm -hmm. transitions should head, where they should go, mm -hmm. then we will no longer be able to collaborate. And I gave an example, men and women don't collaborate on making children mm -hmm. anymore. That's right. The statistic. No? Right. So if we don't collaborate, we're doomed. We will perish. We are not stronger than the dinosaurs. We are much weaker. We are much less successful as a species than the dinosaurs. We don't live in deserts. They did. Mm -hmm. We don't live under the sea. They did. Yes. They were much more successful than us. Than yes. Wow. Almost the last sip of the mega pint. I didn't even realize. <laughs> I time it. I time it. Judiciously and sagaciously. I can see that. I finish my wine when the interview is finished. It's like, a, it's like an hourglass, you know, with the sand. I can see this is a routine. Yeah. Very good at it. So the last sip, how do we how do we make this last sip <laughs> worth it? Meaningful. That's up to you. You're in the driver's seat. I'm at your disposal. We're in the drive. What really what question really haunts you, bothers you? Question that you kind of never everything I asked uh, are part of my questions that really triggered me to find answers. And uh, why don't you contribute a question? I mean, to yourself, not okay, to me. No, I should ask you actually. What is your main message in uh, mm -hmm. in digital mind of tomorrow in your book? What's the main yeah. message? If you have to distill it into a few sentences. What are you trying to okay. say? What are you trying to do? Okay. Um, I actually started to figure it out, to be honest. Um, I think down the core, I'm trying to call for more humans. I found we're less and less humane, and we don't conduct human thinking. And I think that's a true threat for everything, because we're the one, as you mentioned, direct everything. If we don't collab, if we kind of lost our human feature, our human traits, that is irreplaceable, and we're in real doomed danger. <laughs> yes. So I basically agree with you. Because yes. You're, you're also saying that humans should collaborate and work together towards a better future and so on. And if they don't, then we're doomed. We should collaborate, not just between human, among human, we should collaborate with the nature. It should be a whole holistic system because mm -hmm. we all kind of interact with a, one another, one object to another object. We can get out of this cycle. And I can't see any of us can be the, on this planet independently. So, yes, I agree with you. It's a good point because I think we have transitioned from life-centered civilizations to a death cult. What is a death cult? A death cult is when you invest your emotions mm -hmm. in material goods. Mm -hmm. You're emotionally attached to your smartphone. I saw, I saw people mourning the loss of a smartphone more than they grieved over a broken relationship. Seriously, I saw it. They were much more devastated when they lost a smartphone than when they lost a boyfriend. You know? We we're invested in material goods which are which are dead. The objects are dead. It's a death cult. And so we have transitioned into a death cult. And nature is alive. When we had abandoned life as the organizing principle of civilization, and instead we introduced materialism, which is yes. a death cult, then yes. of course naturally we gave up on nature because nature is life. You cannot monetize nature. You cannot own nature. 
You cannot trade nature. All these activities are about death. They are thanatic. They are about death. Mm -hmm. Trading, buying, selling, owning, they're all about death. And now we are beginning to treat each other as objects, even in psychology. We call, it, we call people objects. We are beginning to treat it as, so if you're an object to me, I can own you. I can sell you. I can buy you. I can bribe you. You know, it's, it be, everything becomes a transaction. The same way I own my glass of wine or my, or my television, I can own you. We are commoditizing each other. We're beginning to treat each other as consumer goods, as consumables. So we consume each other and then we dump each other. We dispose of each other. We discard each other. The same way you discard an old television because it's a new model. You know? mm -hmm. Everything, consumerism is a serious poison and it is the enemy of a true stewardship of nature. Consumerism is the opposite of nature. Is is about death. Nature is about life. So we cut forests. Forests are made of living organisms. Mm -hmm. There's trees. We now know that trees communicate. We know the trees you know, do almost everything except walk. Mm -hmm. We cut them down. Mm -hmm. we cut them down because we need to convert them into dead mm -hmm. objects. Mm -hmm. Then we sell these dead objects, and the people who buy these dead objects, they're yeah. made happy because they have a dead object in their living room. Yeah, I'll tell you how creepy this is. We live in a seriously creepy civilization, you know, mm -hmm. where we are surrounded by death, and we find it extremely stimulating and wonderful. We live thirty-one percent of us, thirty-one percent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are lifelong singles mm -hmm. will never have another person in their home will never have a living so they have cats <laughs> or dogs they don't have other human beings in their lives mm -hmm. but but they have televisions and smartphones and cars and that makes them happy death makes them happy we celebrate death it's horrible horrible and here's one thing yeah if you celebrate death Death yeah. will celebrate you. If you celebrate death, mm -hmm. there will come a moment that you will internalize death and you will die and death will celebrate it. Death will celebrate you if you let it in your house. And we have let death into our abode, into our homes. And it's not the kind of guest who goes away. Cheers to the last sip of mega pine. Thank you. Dead, dead mega pine. No, <laughs> there's nothing. There. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you for this thought provoking, bold sharing thank you. between thank us, you. among it us. It was a pleasure to talk to you. I'm going to turn off the recording now. Okay. I'm going to ask you something. Okay. Sure.